What else do we learn? That we must be determined to love Jehovah and Jesus more than we love anyone else. We are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. Uh, this showed the doctor that this was a young man who had his own stand, his own convictions. Uh, if Jehovah tells me that uh, blood is sacred, and then uh, I'm listening. What are we thinking if we ask that question? You know, are we imagining Jehovah saying to Jesus, look at it, this person, you know, they really should die forever. But look at it, they died now before the great tribulation. Oh no, we have to resurrect them. They've had life. And life is more than any of us deserves. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. In this video, I'll be giving you a rundown of the worst videos produced by Jehovah's Witnesses in 2023. So, just to be clear, this is a video that has been voted for by my patrons and YouTube channel members. When they initially voted for it, I had a bit of apprehension because, to be completely honest, it is rather draining emotionally to go back and look at some of this really toxic, grotesque material. But nonetheless, I think it's important to document this wherever possible. And I think it's a wise choice by my patrons and YouTube channel members. So thank you to them very much indeed. The list isn't in a precise order. I've tried to number it so that we end up with the worst being number one and the not so worst being number 10. But I'm sure there will be many watching who disagree with the numbering or who perhaps feel that there are other videos that I've maybe missed out or overlooked. Please do drop them in the comments below. But without further ado, here are my 10 worst videos from 2023. Abraham. Here I am. Take, please, your son, your only son whom you so love, Isaac, and travel to the land of Moriah and offer him up there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will designate to you. In the past, Abraham had asked God questions about some of his judgments and decisions. But now, his friendship and trust in Jehovah had grown. He didn't ask anything at all. You stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and worship and return to you. Father. Yes, my son. Here the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God himself will provide the sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham, Abraham, there I am. do not harm the boy. Oh. Do not do anything at all to him. Oh. For now I do know that you are God-fearing because you have not withheld your son, your only one, from me. Lovely, isn't it? 
So this was a video that was shown as a segment in the October 2023 JW Broadcasting episode. What do I really need to add? I mean, I guess if you're a Christian, I guess if you're someone who takes the Bible seriously as the Word of God, you're not going to see too much wrong here. You know, those of us who have kind of gone beyond thinking of this book as being inspired by God, um, are able to look at this particular story with frankly disgust, especially if you are or have been a parent, the thought of, well, everyone, every parent absolutely fears the, the possibility of outliving their children. But to go one step further and be willing to actually murder your child, regardless of the justification, in this case, Abraham is hearing voices in his head, but it's just such an overtly wrong thing to do, to, to murder your son or daughter. And you can see very clearly the application in the context of the Jehovah's Witness theology, a religion that requires parents to not only metaphorically kill their children by shunning them if they ever get disfellowshipped or leave the organization, but also to literally, in some cases, kill their children if their child requires a blood transfusion, if their minor child requires a blood transfusion, they are required by their faith to push things as far as they can in terms of stopping doctors from administering life-saving treatment. So you can see the utility here of a video sneaked into the JW Broadcasting episodes that validates this absolutely barbaric behavior, this abnegation of the sacred responsibility of parents to look after their offspring. So I had to include it. The next few videos that I've chosen for you, or the remainder of the list, are already videos that I've examined during the normal course of my rebuttals throughout 2023. Obviously, I'm not doing regular rebuttals anymore, but I was doing regular rebuttals for the majority of 2023. And rather than go back and repeat my thoughts all over again, I hope you don't mind if I avoid a duplication of efforts and avoid just trying to come up with fancy ways of saying more or less the same thing, and just show you what I've already said regarding the remaining examples of terrible videos that were put out by Jehovah's Witnesses in 2023. But have you ever asked a similar question? Maybe when you were just coming into the truth? Have you ever asked, for example, will none of those who died in the flood get a resurrection? even those who may never have heard of Noah? And what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Will everyone who died in Sodom and Gomorrah sleep an everlasting sleep? The women, the children, babies. And was there not one redeemable Assyrian soldier in that band of 185,000 who died at the hand of Jehovah's angel? We don't have the answer to those questions. But we do know one thing. The merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. No one his family must have been very busy building the ark. How much time did they have for preaching? And were they able to do seldom worked territory? Uh, we have found that people who live within 10 miles of Bethel have never heard of Jehovah's Witnesses. So can we guarantee that everyone living on earth uh, during that time knew of Noah and what he was doing? We can't really say that.
And can we say that if someone had been given an adequate opportunity, he still would have turned his back on Jehovah? We just can't say that. Now, of course, if Jehovah didn't bring them back, they wouldn't have any grounds for complaint. They've had life. And life is more than any of us deserves. Life is more than any of us deserves. David Splain there, folks. <laughs> Governing body member. Life is more than any of us deserves. You don't deserve life. You know, why are you complaining? <laughs> you were burnt to a crisp at Sodom and Gomorrah. You were drowned in the flood of Noah's day. You were a baby who was drowned in the flood of Noah's day. Uh, what's all this complaining for? <laughs> you didn't deserve to be alive in the first place. Isn't this just gutter apologetics for that can be applied to almost anything, that can be used by any narcissist? Well, you know, why are you complaining you don't even deserve to be here? You know, you're, you're basically an intruder. <laughs> Who do you think you are? having an opinion on all of this. You don't even deserve to be alive. That's the reasoning that Jehovah's Witnesses are being given to explain, essentially, Bible atrocities. We invite you to turn again to 2 Peter chapter 3. But this time, when we turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to apply Paul, uh, Peter's inspired words to two distinct groups of people, namely those who have not yet been baptized and those who already are baptized. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, and this time we'll read verse 11. There we read, 2 Peter 3, 11. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, consider what sort of people you ought to be in holy acts of conduct and deeds of godly devotion. So you see, this verse urges us to consider what type of or what sort of people we ought to be. With this in mind, how can a person who has been delaying baptism show that he treasures God's patience? Well, such a person would do well to ask himself, how much longer will I delay reforming or correcting any conduct in my life that displeases God. Verse 11 indicates something. Do you note there that it mentions dissolved? This word dissolved, as one translation renders it, this dissolved is rendered disintegrated. Well, that word denotes objects that will be broken into small particles, in other words, destroyed. What will be dissolved, broken into pieces, disintegrated? Well, the previous verse tells us. If you look there in verse number 10, Peter was referring to what he mentioned as the elements. The elements. Well, in other words, this system of things, including any person who, as our publications have described, is incorrigibly wicked. Now, the dictionary says that an incorrigible person is one who cannot be reformed cannot be corrected. Thus, if you have not yet dedicated your life to Jehovah and been baptized, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11 lovingly is urging you to treasure God's wealth of patience by bringing your conduct, your deeds, into line with his holy will and do so without delay. Is it just me, or did we just hear a long-winded death threat <laughs> from Ramon Hines, who is a Bethelite at the Warwick, New York, World Headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, here giving the final talk on the Friday morning of the Exercise Patience 2023 convention, his theme, Treasure the Riches of God's Patience. He's just read a verse in 2 Peter 3 talking about the elements of the system being dissolved 
and he's gone to great lengths to explain how that actually means disintegrated, broken into small particles, destroyed. And rather than talking in terms of governments or institutions or, I don't know, armies, he's gone straight to people, people who displease God, people who are incorrigibly wicked. They won't be reformed. They won't be converted to Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're refusing to get baptized, if you're delaying getting baptized, you're being incorrigible. You're refusing to reform your ways and you are therefore worthy of being dissolved, disintegrated, <laughs> broken into small particles or destroyed. Charming, isn't it? Well, we have the privilege to live during the last days where true knowledge was foretold to become abundant. But even still, it is released and made known at a pace that we can absorb, that we can handle, and that we can use. And we thank Jehovah for that. Well, knowing this, then, we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do, is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. We understand this is how Jehovah operates. He reveals matters gradually when it is needed. Well, it's convenient for him to say that, but the evidence suggests strongly in the other direction. Because if the governing body isn't embarrassed about adjustments that are made, then why aren't they letting all Jehovah's Witnesses have access to the historic publications going back to 1879, would be my question. Because as I've learned on this channel during the progress of my activism, um, specifically through speaking to former Bethelites, it turns out that there is actually a form of JW Library, or Watchtower Online Library, whatever you want to call it, that goes all the way back to, to the 19th century with the publications of Watchtower. And they're able to search the publications by keyword and bring up articles on various subjects. And it's only Bethel elders that are allowed to do that. For everybody else, for the rank and file, the Watchtowers only go as far back as 1950 and the Awakes only go as far back as 1970. And it's the same, I think, for books and, and brochures. So my question would be, Jeffrey Winder, if you're watching this, hi. If you're not embarrassed, why don't you let Jehovah's Witnesses have access to historical publications, to their spiritual heritage? I think you manifestly are embarrassed because you're not dignifying your own followers, your own sheep, with the ability to do their own research into what their own religion has taught previously on various subjects. I think you are deeply embarrassed and he says nor is any apology nor is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously well that's convenient isn't it the, the man who or one of the men who presides over the faith of millions doesn't think it fitting to apologize for past teachings that it turns out later with the benefit of hindsight have been total lies imitate able patiently rely on jehovah a hearty spirit may cause us to think what's the harm in calling once in a while to chat maybe i can help the person come back to jehovah that is haughty thinking instead let's follow the admonition that jehovah gives us proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 proverbs chapter 3 and let's read together verses 5 and 6 Trust in Jehovah with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, take notice of him and he will make your path straight. Uh, trust like humility is a quality that works in concert with patience. Abel displayed trust in Jehovah. In Jehovah's arrangement, the discipline administered to his parents for disobeying God. 
He also trusted in Jehovah's matchless wisdom and love. We know this because he served Jehovah faithfully. His righteousness separated him from his parents and his brothers who did not serve Jehovah. That was no doubt difficult for Abel, but he was confident that in the future, offspring, others would join him in serving Jehovah. He just had to be patient. Speaking of offspring, didn't Abel have sex with his sister? <laughs> We've just been listening to Curry Waddlington from the Warkill, New York Bethel facility. He's giving the symposium item, better to be patient than to be haughty in spirit. Imitate Abel, not Adam. And in all seriousness, what grotesque rhetoric. So Jehovah's Witnesses here who refuse to shun, who cannot bring themselves to break off contact with family members or loved ones who have been disfellowshipped, who cannot lose their humanity in that way. They, they can't quite switch off their humanity in the way that the organization requires of them. They're here being labeled haughty. Apparently, it's a prideful thing for them to even want to reach out to their disfellowshipped relatives. Chilling, isn't it? I mean, many of you watching this will be disfellowshipped or disassociated. And this is the sort of rhetoric your believing family members will be hearing, unfortunately, at this year's convention, because even though Curry Wadlington is just giving the talk at this particular convention that's been chosen for the JW stream, he's reading from an outline, essentially. He's just parroting the words of the organization that Jehovah's Witness speakers all over the world are required to stick to. But again, chilling rhetoric about shunning, and I'm afraid there's more. What else do we learn? That we must be determined to love Jehovah and Jesus more than we love anyone else. And Jesus reiterated this message when he was on earth talking to a group of disciples. And what he said is recorded in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37. Whoever therefore has greater affection for father or mother than for me is not worthy of me. And whoever has greater affection for son or daughter than for me is not worthy of me. How do we apply these words? Well, if we have a difficult family situation, a member of our family is disfellowshipped, our affection for them should not be greater than our affection for Jehovah and Jesus. To that end, when reading the Bible and attending our meetings, our goal should be to make our relationship with Jehovah and Jesus stronger and stronger. Another quality that works in concert with patience is hope. Unlike Abel's parents, our dear loved one who is disfellowshipped may still repent. Don't give up hope. By showing patience and supporting the decision that was made to disfellowship our dear loved one, our loved one may come back. They may turn around. May we prove our love for Jehovah by being patient and respecting his arrangement for discipline, even though it's a difficult situation. Jehovah will love us for our patience and will consider us righteous as he does Abel. Divine wisdom in God's word tells us better to be patient than to be haughty in spirit. We learn from the examples of Adam and Abel that this is particularly true when a member of our family is disciplined. This is the JW stream version of this year's convention. And when it comes to shunning, having already told Jehovah's Witnesses who can't shun or refuse to shun that they are haughty, Curry Wadlington, Bethelite at the Wallkill New York facility, has the following to say. What else do we learn? That we must be determined to love Jehovah and Jesus more than we love anyone else. We must be determined to love Jehovah and Jesus more than anyone else. <laughs> I, 
I'm sorry to keep saying this, but this is supposed to be a convention that ordinary members of the public would find helpful. This has been sold to the public as a convention about helping people cultivate patience as some kind of self-help seminar. But how culty do you need it to be here? He's literally saying you need to love Jehovah and Jesus more than anyone, anyone, including your own family members. And doesn't that make sense in the context of an organisation that uses shunning as a control tactic that weaponizes family relationships, family relationships, as a means of punishment? So that if you disagree with the leadership, if you change your mind about being a Jehovah's Witness, your entire world can collapse around you. Frankly, how dare Corey Wadlington suggest that any of this is scriptural? He invokes verses from the Gospels about a person's enemies being from their own household. I've done a video, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious, with 14 14 Bible verses that debunk shunning as practiced by Jehovah's Witnesses. So no matter what verses Corey Wadlington has to throw at us in support of this vile ideology of which he is making himself a mouthpiece, we can find Bible verses that are against shunning that say, you know what, let's show some mercy here Let's recognise that we all make mistakes from time to time. And let's just show some love. You know, you can find so many verses in the Bible that have that sort of language where this pharisaical attitude of excommunication is condemned by Jesus. But of course, none of those Bible verses are convenient in this talk. Instead... What's convenient is for the organisation to make Jehovah's Witnesses who are tempted to reach out to their disfellowshipped family members feel terrible. Really, when you think about it, when it comes to the damage that's done by shunning, it's not just the shunned who suffer. It's the ones who are doing the shunning. Because they must be so conflicted I mean, not all of them will be. I think some Jehovah's Witnesses, like my dad, just aren't that bothered, to be quite honest. That's that's how I perceive the shunning in my own situation with my father. But there will be many Jehovah's Witnesses who are just being slowly destroyed by all this. They cannot cope with it. They are having to pretend that someone they profoundly love, perhaps someone they brought into the world, who they cradled as a baby, they're having to pretend that these people don't exist. To add insult to injury, to really put the boot in, Curry Wadlington says this. Unlike Abel's parents, our dear loved one who is disfellowshipped may still repent. Don't give up hope. Our loved one may come back. They may turn around. Our loved one may come back. They may turn around. Don't give up hope. Keep yourself in this perpetual state of uncertainty where there's always a chance. There's always a chance that the person you're shunning might see the error of their ways and, and come running back. Well, that does happen, doesn't it? Because the whole tactic, the whole point behind shunning is emotional blackmail. And even the organization's literature acknowledges this aspect of shunning, that it may have the effect of making the person want to come back because they miss their family and they miss their association with their believing loved ones. They're open about it. But how cruel, how sadistic 
to keep Jehovah's Witnesses who are shunning disfellowshipped or disassociated loved ones. How cruel to keep them in this purgatory of constant denial where even if their loved one no longer wants to be a Jehovah's Witness for conscientious reasons, they cannot come back because they don't believe it anymore because they've realized it's not true. Apparently, even in those cases, Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to live in hope and never give up on the possibility that their loved one will return to Jehovah. But, of course, we might be thinking, yes, well, I understand why we said what we did before, but is it really the case that all these ones that we've studied with or so on, some of them may have a chance to join us after Babylon the Great is destroyed? Is that fair? <laughs> Last-minute repentance. But you see, are we imitating the merciful judge of all the earth? Really, we shouldn't be surprised if that were to happen, should we? You see, does someone's eternal salvation depend on when they die? Or does it depend on really their heart condition? You see, the merciful judge of the earth knows their heart condition. And really, what are we thinking if we ask that question? You know, are we imagining Jehovah saying to Jesus, look, uh, this person, you know, they really should die forever. But look at it, they died now before the Great Tribulation. Oh, no, we have to resurrect them. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> See, Jehovah is the righteous, merciful judge. He knows people's hearts. You can't fool him or trick him. Isn't it cute that Jeffrey Jackson gets to do stand-up on the silliness and ridiculousness of Jehovah's Witness theology from his position as a governing body member who gets to decide what that theology is and gets to change his mind? He's the only one, or him and his colleagues, are the only ones who can do this, who can laugh at their own teachings, who can change their minds who can get the audience in hysterics with how silly the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are, they're the only ones allowed to do this. If you were to try to give a similar talk about an existing Jehovah's Witness teaching in a normal kingdom hall as an elder, watch how quickly you get frog-marched out of the kingdom hall. It honestly sickened me to hear all of the laughter. We need your help in this preaching activity. Then there's also the constructing of kingdom halls, assembly halls, places of worship, branch facilities used in Jehovah's service, and also donating to the worldwide work. Here's an experience from Mexico. A little girl we'll call Laura, age six, lives in Mexico. Sadly, she suffers from epilepsy. And after one particularly difficult hospital visit, her older sister gave her a piggy bank as a gift. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Laura received money from her family to use for school or to buy treats. And what did she do with the money? She decided to save the money in her piggy bank, depositing it there. Well, when in-person meetings resumed, Laura brought her piggy bank to the Kingdom Hall. What did she do with it? After the meeting, she broke it open, counted the money she saved, and it totaled 350 pesos, or about 17 United States dollars. She contributed the entire amount, giving half to support the local congregation and the other half to the worldwide work. Laura explained, I wanted to donate my savings for our brothers to use and to send more brothers to preach in foreign lands. Think about it. All of this was going through the mind of a six-year-old. She also asked for another piggy bank, of course, so that she could start saving once again. But that's not all. She's trying to learn to read and write so that she personally can share the good news with others. She can tell others about her loving God, Jehovah. By her actions, that little girl is essentially gathering at Jesus' right hand among the sheep. She's precious to Jehovah. She's precious to Jesus. She's precious to each one of us here in attendance. 
What a creep. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gage Flegel. You may be a newly appointed governing body member, but you're not endearing yourself to me at this point. I mean, fresh out of the gates, you're showing the mindset that it takes to get to the highest echelon of the Jehovah's Witness organization. You need to be the type of soulless creep who celebrates an, a six-year-old epileptic girl giving all of her money to the organization. You have to be the sort of person who thinks that's fantastic. And as though Laura, this epileptic girl, came up with this idea all by herself, I don't think it was quite that simple. That the governing body will continue to do everything in our power to provide the needed relief aid to our dear brothers in these affected areas. We love you very much, and thank you for tuning in for this update. I wish we this could help. Me too. Oh, I have an idea. What is it, sweetie? Can I give this to our brothers affected by the hurricane? Of course you can. We'll put it in the contribution box on Sunday. I don't know, maybe I'm being overly cynical, but it feels like that Caleb and Sophia cartoon might have played at least some role in Laura's decision to empty her piggy bank, or sorry, break her piggy bank, to get at $17, and the piggy bank was a gift. <laughs> so straight away, children are being taught to have a very unhealthy view of gifts in relation to the urgency of giving money to the organization. And then, of course, we have another Caleb and Sophia cartoon. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it, where Laura got her idea from? She's been subjected to targeted child propaganda, coercing children to turn over any money that they might have that's been given to them for their needs to the organisation. So kids have to go without ice cream. They have to go without... What was it? Laura was given money for her school and for treats. So she then has less money for when she goes back to school. She has less money for treats. This is supposed to be a positive. This is something that the organization is proud of. So how can we continue to be faithful in spite of our human weaknesses? Growing up, I had, like, absolutely no health problems at all. And I loved playing basketball, and uh, I enjoyed uh, my life in the congregation. This was a kid who had his whole life in front of him, and it was taken away in a moment. 
November of 2019, I was diagnosed with a massive brain tumor. I'm saying, like, why me? Uh, did I do something wrong? I wanted to know why it had to uh, happen now. Uh, at 16, uh, I'm close to 18, what I think is like the prime of my life. The night before I was going to have surgery was probably one of the scariest nights of my life. So I wanted to be able to still do the things I loved and I really just didn't want my life to end. The account of David, uh, that was one that was uh, very uh, prominent in my mind. There was many times in his life where he had to fight foes uh, that were very scary and life-threatening. And this situation I was dealing with was pretty scary and life-threatening, but I knew Jehovah had my back. We're watching the story of Elijah Vega as it appears in the May 2023 JW Broadcasting episode. This is a disturbing testimonial. I mean, you have the usual manipulative ingredients of the soft piano music that's intended to play to people's emotions so that they can more easily swallow the narrative that's being fed to them of loyalty to God under any circumstances being the most important thing. But when you strip away all of that, all of that manipulative stuff, what you have here is a deeply disturbing story, which in the context of what we've already heard in this particular episode of JW Broadcasting, splits wide apart any notion of divine intervention or God having any involvement whatsoever, frankly, in human affairs. So we had Elijah give the heartbreaking account of being diagnosed at the age of 16 with a brain tumour. November of 2019, I was diagnosed with a massive brain tumour. I wanted to know why it had to uh, happen now. Uh, at 16, uh, I'm close to 18, what I think is like the prime of my life. So a 16-year-old Jehovah's Witness has a brain tumour and it's life-threatening. He could easily lose his life. Predictably, the blood issue is going to come into play here. He's going to have to make a decision as to whether he wants to compromise and accept medical treatment with blood, even if it may save his life, or go down some other route of refusing blood and accepting medical alternatives. Spoiler alert, it's never really clarified to what extent blood was an issue. But let's just remember what Stephen Lett has said in this very episode of JW Broadcasting. Now today, we don't expect Jehovah's angels to deliver us miraculously, but Jehovah can use them to maneuver circumstances so we find a job to provide for our family. So Jehovah is in the business through his angels of finding Jehovah's Witnesses jobs, helping them with their employment so that they'll find suitable employment that will help them attend all their meetings. He does that sort of thing. But he's not going to stop a 16-year-old having a brain tumour. I'm sorry, that makes no sense whatsoever. Or more to the point, as I've repeatedly argued, if that's truly the case, then Jehovah is very messed up. At the very least you could say is that he has woeful prioritisation skills. We talked about getting the brothers from HLC there to talk, to back us up with the alternatives on his card. The doctor was impressed when he asked Elijah if he had any questions. And Elijah asked him a couple of questions about the procedure and then also brought up the blood issue. Uh, this showed the doctor that this was a young man who had his own stand, his own convictions. Uh, if Jehovah tells me that uh, blood is sacred and 
then uh, I'm listening. Elijah kept on reminding us that even if he doesn't wake up on this surgery bed, no matter what happens, he's still gonna wake up, whether it's now or in the future, in paradise. They finally came out only to tell us that there was complication. Elijah fell into a coma and um, we were waiting on answers that the doctors weren't able to give us. It was roughly about close to five months that he was in a coma. However, Jehovah kept providing the friends the support. We kept getting texts telling us just how many friends were praying for Elijah and for all of us to get through this. So this poor lad ended up in a coma for five months. And you have to ask the question, because it's not clarified in any way, shape or form in this testimonial, even though they bring up the blood issue. You know, we're not the ones mentioning the blood issue. They're the ones who mention it. They're the ones who put a HLC goon on camera as a talking head helping us understand this story, and yet they neglect to indicate to what extent the blood issue led may have led or not led to these complications that resulted in Elijah being in a coma for five months. Why can't you clarify that? It's a simple piece of information it, it's a huge gap in the narrative and frankly it insults the audience for them to miss this information out even though they are making a big deal of the blood issue the doctor was impressed when he asked elijah if he had any questions and elijah asked him a couple of questions about the procedure and then also brought up the blood issue uh, this showed the doctor that this was a young man who had his own stand, his own convictions. Uh, if Jehovah tells me that uh, blood is sacred, then uh, I'm listening. He had his own stand, did he, Peter? Peter Brusses, Brusesi from the Hospital Liaison Committee. Apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Elijah had his own stand. It, it was his own decision. It's not like he was being threatened with death at Armageddon if he committed the sin of taking someone else's blood into his body. It's not like he was being threatened with disassociation if he, quote, willfully and unrepentantly accepted blood, which is what it says in the chapter on disassociation in the secret Shepherd the Flock of God book that's in Peter's briefcase, but that he doesn't show to doctors and medical staff when he's inserting himself in these life or death matters. Why do they need to lie? <laughs> Why do they need to be shameful about this? Why can't they just be upfront with medical professionals? In life or death situations, you know, these are doctors who are trying to save people and, and trying to assist, in this case, a young lad who has a brain tumour in a way that will allow him to continue with a good quality of life. And rather than be up front and say, you know, Elijah is in this situation where we believe if he accepts blood, he's worthy of death at Armageddon. And we'll be honest with you, if he changes his mind as a Jehovah's Witness and at the last minute decides that he wants a blood transfusion, we'll disassociate him so he, he will have repercussions why can't they be upfront about it? If it's something they're so proud about, oh, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. We 
obey God's command on blood. Why can't you be upfront about the fact that it isn't really a case of individual or personal choice? Elijah was going into this incredibly difficult situation, having his decisions made for him by a group that persuades people to die rather than accept blood. Uh, spring of 2020 is when I gradually began to wake up. It's uh, way harder to uh, move around as I used to. Super uh, painful and hard. I have ataxia as of right now, temporarily in my right hand. Uh, so I'm not able to uh, perform certain activities as well as I would like to. In my heart, I love basketball and I wish I could uh, participate, but uh, knowing I can't because of something I can't control physically, uh, it's really hard on me. Job, he was always a great example in the Bible to me. Uh, I view him in a totally different light now because he was also hit with a medical issue. So, but he managed to maintain uh, his uh, faith and Jehovah eventually blessed Job for that. Since the coma, Elijah's seal definitely hasn't lessened. If anything, it's increased. He gives a whole new meaning to widening out because we want to be as zealous and as busy in the ministry as he is. Elijah has not accomplished any of this in his own strength. Uh, he very quickly will give credit to Jehovah, but also will give credit to his family for the amount of support that he's received and give credit to the brothers and sisters for the support he's received from them as well. He's been engaged in the field ministry and he's been active in doing whatever assignments we give him uh, within the congregation. We were able to appoint him a ministerial servant. He's got all of this support. He knows that Jehovah's with him. And in that sense, Jehovah truly is at his right hand. I know that we have a hope that Jehovah has given us in the future a perfect life. It gives me a goal and more of a motivation to help everyone reach that goal and get there. There's light at the end of the tunnel. So I thank Jehovah for that so much. Elijah, you are a precious gem in Jehovah's eyes. How tragic. It's just heartbreaking, isn't it? To consider, well, again, so much is being left out of this story and it's wrong to speculate quite frankly as to whether the situation would have been different if blood transfusions had not been an issue for Elijah but how tragic that this huge health issue that Elijah has faced at the very least is being exploited by the organization for propaganda value and milked to death to get across this message that faithfulness and loyalty to the organization is paramount. And to add insult to injury, you know, you have this HLC goon who's again being used as a talking head. For me, he's giving off very kind of politician vibes. He doesn't he doesn't really have sincerity, you know, in from my perspective. He comes across as a very fake, superficial individual, and maybe it's just the way he comports himself. Maybe he can't help it. But he is describing the whole situation as though it's a win because Elijah is now a ministerial servant. Oh, never mind the fact that you were in a coma for five months. Never mind that you've been through this massive ordeal. We've made you a servant. As though that in any way makes up for the fact that this young man can't play basketball, even though he loves it. You know, that was heartbreaking for me. I can't imagine how frustrating it would be for me as someone in his 40s to not be able to play football when I love football and I'm in my 40s. This young man has his whole life ahead of him and he has to watch on while his friends play basketball. But it's okay because they've made him a servant. 
and we're told that Jehovah is by his side. He's at his right hand. Well, where was Jehovah when the brain tumour first surfaced? Why wasn't Jehovah doing something in that situation? Even though we've learned again in this very JW Broadcasting episode that Jehovah is the sort of God who arranges for his angels to find Jehovah's Witnesses' employment. Likewise today, just as mankind is harming the actual planet, the world under Satan's control is also ruining all flesh. In both ways, the earth is being ruined. How so? Along with false religion, human society in general is gradually corrupting everything that Jehovah has set in place for mankind. We see it in their incessant nationalistic wars. We see it in their racial hatred and divisiveness. We see it in their promoting of abortion. We see it in their so-called gay marriage. We see it in the gender blurring that the world is promoting. You don't have to be a man or a woman, they say. You can be whatever you feel like or choose to be. Really? What does Jehovah say about that? At Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, he told the nation of Israel that, quote, a woman must not put on the clothing of a man, nor should a man wear the clothing of a woman, for anyone doing so is detestable to Jehovah your God. If that is how the Creator feels about the switching of clothing, how much more detestable he must view the world's attempts to blur the lines of gender with false labeling. Recently, the World Health Organization adjusted its view of gender. It now states that, quote, there are many genders existing on a spectrum from male to female. It added that gender identity exists on a continuum and that sex is not limited to male or female. Again, really? Talk about an attempt to tear apart what Jehovah has made. Where do I even begin with the utter nonsense, the, let's just say it, verbal diarrhea that Kenneth Cook has just come out with? He was normally the quiet one. <laughs> he was normally the dull one. I mean, if there's a convention program or an annual meeting um, and Kenneth Cook appears at the lectern, typically I would... Well, not completely so now. I'd still want to listen to what he has to say, but I wouldn't be expecting anything quite like this. This is more the sort of talk that Tony Morris would have given when he was a governing body member, or perhaps Stephen Lett, or perhaps David Splain. I didn't have Kenneth Cook down as being capable of this sort of talk. Let's start off with abortion. Human society in general is gradually corrupting everything that Jehovah has set in place for mankind. We see it in their incessant nationalistic wars. We see it in their racial hatred and divisiveness. We see it in their promoting of abortion. The promoting of abortion. So abortion is something that is promoted. This is what we would call a straw man argument. So Kenneth Cook is manufacturing a caricature of a position to make it easier to present a case against it. As far as I'm aware, very few people, if anyone, are actually promoting abortion. In other words, going out and saying, hey, you should all get abortions. Why don't you get pregnant just so you can have an abortion? Because having an abortion is great. I, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's always going to be a very small minority of sadists who would say that sort of thing and, you know, have mental issues, quite frankly, when it comes to, you know, the idea of getting pregnant just to have an abortion. I mean, never write anything off when it comes to the 
capacity for human evil and perversion. But that's not really what we're seeing in terms of the way or the approach that society takes to abortion, which is to say, let the woman choose if there is a situation in which the woman is unable, for whatever reason, to carry a baby to full term. That's the position of society. It's a position of allowing women the choice to have an abortion if they so choose. You can agree or disagree with that. That's probably for a whole other video, which, quite frankly, I, I don't have the mental capacity to make right now. But surely we can all agree that Kenneth Cook's words and the reality of the, of the situation are two very different things. It's one thing to promote abortion. It's another thing to promote a woman's right to an abortion if the woman feels, for whatever reason, that that terrible decision needs to be made. So that's the first thing. Second thing, we have Kenneth Cook's bizarre attack on the transgender community. We see it in the gender blurring that the world is promoting. You don't have to be a man or a woman, they say. You can be whatever you feel like or choose to be. Really? What does Jehovah say about that? At Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, he told the nation of Israel that, quote, a woman must not put on the clothing of a man, nor should a man wear the clothing of a woman, for anyone doing so is detestable to Jehovah your God. So Kenneth Cook, governing body member, part of God's channel of communication with mankind, has a problem with trans people because, number one, really? <laughs> That's apparently a mature way of approaching this incredibly sensitive topic, to just dismiss it as gender blurring, or however he puts it, and respond by saying, really? That, that, to me, does not speak of any sort of wisdom or any sort of thoughtfulness in approaching this subject. If you're just going to say, really? You're not really interested in persuading people. You are speaking to an echo chamber. You are aware that the majority of people hearing your words already agree with you, and you're therefore just saying, really? As if to anticipate the fact that your audience already agrees with you. So that was very, very tedious. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, about men putting on the clothing of women or women putting on the clothing of men and saying that this is detestable. This is really the best Kenneth Cook has got when it comes to slamming the idea of people switching gender. This, this is his, his best argument that he can reach for. And obviously that verse doesn't talk about changing your gender biologically. It's just talking about clothing. But he uses the old slippery slope fallacy of, well, how much more so? <laughs> if it's talking about clothing, then how much more so would God view it as view it as detestable for genders to be blurred by false labeling or whatever, or I guess by extension by males becoming females or females becoming males? I think it's worth just pondering on this if you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you find this, again, frankly, juvenile reasoning persuasive. Let's just pause on this verse in Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. 
A woman must not put on the clothing of a man, nor should a man wear the clothing of a woman. For anyone doing so is detestable to Jehovah your God. That's the verse upon which Kenneth Cook is hanging his argument against trans people. That's the verse. For me, this is a classic example of the Jehovah's Witness obsession with sex. When it comes to sex and rules about sex and forms of sex or sexuality that are agreeable or disagreeable, this is an organisation that has written mountains of material telling people what sexuality they're allowed to have, to whom they're allowed to be attracted, with whom they're allowed to have sex. You, you can only have sex with fellow believers to whom you're married, essentially, and certainly not fellow believers who are of the same gender. So you have to be heterosexual. You have to marry only in the Lord. You have to only be married, in other words, even if you're both consenting adults, it's not okay to have sex. You have rule after rule after rule after rule. And recently we had a talk by David Splain in which he layered on a whole bunch of other rules to do with sex. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. It's a sex-obsessed organisation and as I've mentioned before, what happens if we compare their approach to sex with their approach to other things that are denounced in the Bible unequivocally, but which get hardly any denunciation or hardly any condemnation in the literature or in the guidance to elders, comparatively speaking. One great example is stealing or theft. I'm going to rattle off now with Tibor's help six Bible verses that condemn stealing. And you'll see where I'm going with this, hopefully. So Exodus 20 verse 15, you must not steal. Exodus 22 verse 7, if a man gives his fellow man money or articles to keep, and these are stolen from the fellow man's house, if the thief is found, he must make double compensation. Leviticus 19 verse 11. You must not steal, you must not deceive, and you must not deal falsely with one another. Mark 10 verse 19. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, Honour your father and your mother. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 10. Thieves, greedy people, drunkards, revilers and extortioners will not inherit God's kingdom. Ephesians 4 verse 28. Let the one who steals steal no more. Rather, let him do hard work, doing good work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with someone in need. So I've just read in quick fire fashion... Six Bible verses, all unequivocally condemning stealing. Kenneth Cook's given us one verse about not dressing in the opposite gender's clothing to denounce trans people as detestable. When we look in the Shepherd book, the book Shepherd the Flock of God, which is like a secret elders-only manual, we get pages and pages and pages about pornea and all of the various ways that you can commit sexual immorality, including by being gay. So there's mountains of material going into the nuances of what sort of sex or what sort of sexuality or what sort of pornography is permissible or unpermissible. Spoiler alert, if it's gay porn or lesbian porn, it's abhorrent. If it's heterosexual porn, it's still you're still going to get a talking to, but at least it's not abhorrent, so it's not as bad. This is 
This is the detail that this book goes into when it comes to sex. Let's see what it says about stealing, shall we? Chapter 12, point 21, stealing thievery. Though all stealing is wrong, the body of elders should use discernment in weighing the circumstances and the extent of the involvement in wrongdoing to determine whether it is a judicial matter. That was it. I, I've not, I'm not kind of missing out material. There's one sentence in the whole book about stealing. And it's, I think you will agree, neither here nor there. It's quite wishy-washy. Well, what are the circumstances? What happens if we replace stealing with cross-dressing, which is what Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 says. Let's take the same sentence. Though all cross-dressing is wrong, detestable, the body of elders should use discernment in weighing the circumstances and the extent of the involvement in wrongdoing to determine whether it is a judicial matter. I don't think you're going to find that anytime soon, are you? You're not going to find a wishy-washy, well, what are the circumstances approach to cross-dressing or switching gender, biologically or otherwise, identifying as another sex. It's always going to be black and white, judgmental, fire and brimstone. How dare you? How dare you decide for yourself what your gender is, what your sexuality is, with which consenting adults you have sex. How dare you? How detestable it would be for you to make the wrong choice in those areas. Stealing, well, um, depends on the circumstances. Then we have Kenneth Cook's bizarre rant about the World Health Organization... Recently, the World Health Organization adjusted its view of gender. It now states that, quote, there are many genders existing on a spectrum from male to female. It added that gender identity exists on a continuum and that sex is not limited to male or female. Again, really? Talk about an attempt to tear apart what Jehovah has made. I don't have too much to say on this other than the obvious, namely that I will always side with the World Health Organization and the many experts who work with said organization over the incoherent judgmental ramblings of Kenneth Cook and his colleagues any day of the week. But it's worth just noticing that there's a double standard here. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, maybe you agree with Kenneth Cook's approach to trans people with his hateful, vile, homophobic stance. Maybe you're down with that. And let's be honest, you don't need to be a Jehovah's Witness to hate gay people or hate trans people. That's unfortunately quite a common thing nowadays. If anything, it seems that in this talk, Kenneth Cook is sort of jumping on the bandwagon I would be interested to know whether he would have given this talk if there weren't such a strong populist groundswell against trans people anyway, with you know notable figures writing material or saying things that encourage an environment in which trans people are, let's just say it, eradicated or have limited access to health care or where laws are passed making it impossible to transition from one gender to another. I think Kenneth Cook is sort of, again, jumping on the bandwagon and thinking, yeah, well, whereas if I go on about gay people, that's going to be almost universally objectionable 
for anyone who is has a, an ounce of compassion or sympathy, when it comes to the issue of trans people, there's a bit more controversy here. And I think we can we can afford to make a name for ourselves by by taking a side, by picking a side that's going to be not quite so controversial because lots of people who aren't even religious feel the same way as we do about trans people. Anyway, I digress. He's talking here about the World Health Organization and he is essentially dismissing a given issue that he's talking about. All I would say is if you are a Jehovah's Witness, even if you agree with him on this, go on Watchtower Online Library and type in, in brackets, World Health Organization. So in the search bar, make sure there are quotation marks, World Health Organization. And, and see how many times Jehovah's Witnesses in their publications cite the World Health Organization as a reliable, reputable source in making their arguments. You're going to get five pages. Five pages of results showing Jehovah's Witnesses quoting from the World Health Organization when it suits them. When the World Health Organization says something that sounds a little bit apocalyptic about a certain pathogen or whatever, that sort of thing. So when it suits the governing body, they'll throw their weight behind the World Health Organization. But the moment the World Health Organization says something that they disagree with on an issue involving sex, suddenly the World Health Organization's word means nothing. And going back to marriage, Jehovah instituted the arrangement to be a permanent bond between a man and a woman. At Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5, we read how Jesus emphasized this while he was on the earth. Quoting from Genesis 2.24, he said this, Have you not read that the one who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and will stick to his wife, and the two will be one flesh? He made them male and female, and the two will be one flesh. Jehovah's purpose for humans is clear, but Satan's world now says that marriage can be between two men or two women. Again, really? We can be certain that promoting this corrupt view is Satan's attempts, part of Satan's attempt to ruin mankind to make them so abhorrent to Jehovah that he would abandon humans and his purpose for mankind and the earth. But that will never happen. God's purpose for mankind and their home will be fulfilled. Well, you'll be pleased to know that's the worst of it. This is as bad as it gets in Kenneth Cook's disgusting talk, The Earth That Will Endure Forever. A parting shot there at gay people in general and the concept of gay marriage and Kenneth Cook invoking Adam and Eve. His argument amounts to, well, in the beginning, it was Adam and Eve. It wasn't Adam and Steve. <laughs> That's essentially his argument. That's how simplistic and childlike God's mouthpiece or God's channel is. To simply say, well, does it make sense biologically, you know? Is this what we see in the Garden of Eden? No. So how on earth can you have gay marriage? To think we used to look up to people like Kenneth Cook, I say we, Jehovah's Witnesses and former Jehovah's Witnesses, we used to think that this was cutting-edge thinking. <laughs> this was really profound wisdom and thoughtfulness to be making these sorts of arguments. But what you find is, if you have any sort of awareness of what 
people in other fundamental or leaders in other fundamentalist Christian groups are saying, what you notice is this is what they're all saying. They're all making these sorts of arguments, all of which completely overlook the glaringly obvious fact that sexuality is something that is part of you and it's something that you're born with. People don't choose to be gay. They, they just are. They are more attracted to the same gender than they are to the opposite gender. In some cases, not remotely attracted to the opposite gender and only attracted to the same gender. And we can say the same thing when it comes to trans people. There is such a thing as gender dysphoria. In fact, there's an entire page on the NHS website. For those of you in America, NHS stands for National Health Service. This is essentially a government website talking about reliable sources with an overview. Maybe Tibor can show if he's gracious the page. Gender dysphoria is a term that describes a sense of unease that a person may have because of a mismatch between their biological sex and their gender identity. This sense of unease or dissatisfaction may be so intense it can lead to depression and anxiety and have a harmful impact on life. It's a real thing where people, for whatever reason, are not comfortable in their bodies when it comes to their gender. And while biologically transitioning isn't always going to be the answer, in many cases it is. And the hatred and vitriol that's directed against people who grapple with this and who find a solution that works for them and just makes it possible to enjoy our fleeting existence on this planet, the hatred and vitriol that's leveled at them is, is just appalling. It, we're talking about people just finding a way of being happy, finding a way of getting through life with all of its struggles and all of its complexities. And in this case, getting through life with an issue that they are, again, born with. So if you want to argue that God views being gay as detestable or being a trans person as detestable, you have to explain why people have gender dysphoria to begin with or how it can be that people are, just purely by observation, clearly born gay, lesbian, straight, bisexual, you name it. A, a variety of different sexualities are present in humankind. Whose fault's that? Mom's disfellowshipping still feels so raw. Elsa, please pick up. I miss you so much. I just want to hear your voice. It's such a struggle. I miss her. She taught me the truth, gave me a stable life. She was my closest friend. What's the harm in just calling once in a while to chat? Maybe I can even help her to come back to Jehovah. Right, well, already I'm starting to see why this was cut from the convention. And to be clear, 
you're getting my very first reaction. I've saved it in such a way that I actually haven't watched it right up until filming, which is very unusual for rebuttals. I wanted to give a raw sort of authentic reaction to something I knew would be grotesque. And it really, well, it was grotesque. It was also fairly realistic in showing the extent of shunning as practiced by Jehovah's Witnesses. This, by the way, is a video that got shown during the, again, Saturday afternoon session of the Exercise Patients 2023 Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. In my initial rebuttal, which you can watch in Sushi 589, titled Jehovah's Witnesses Who Failed to Shun Slammed as Haughty, Curry Wadlington from the Wallkill New York Bethel facility made exactly that argument in the talk Better to be patient than to be haughty in spirit. Imitate Abel, not Adam. And for whatever reason, it seems that the video that we've just seen, along with the follow-up video that we're about to watch, were cut from the spiritual food of Jehovah's Witnesses, supplied by the faithful slave. I don't know to what extent the videos have subsequently been shown at regular conventions. I don't know whether it's just the JW stream that got tampered with, for surreptitious reasons, perhaps if you're watching this and you attended one of these conventions in person, you can comment below as to whether you saw this video flash up on the main screen for everyone to watch. It says a lot, doesn't it, that this is an organization that resorts to such shady tactics. I mean, if the disfellowshipping teaching, if the shunning policy is right and proper and God's command, why aren't they proud of it? Why have they cut it from their JW stream version of the convention? You'd think they'd be proud of it if it's something that's truly God's command, something that sets the organization apart as being pure and true. But no, no, they've got to shuffle things around and create a different version of the convention for those who cannot attend in person. Some have speculated as to the reasons why these videos have been cut from the convention, some suggesting that the proximity of these videos disappearing to a documentary that aired on Channel 4 in the UK uh, by the celebrity Rebecca Vardy, some have said that's no coincidence. It must have been a reaction to the documentary being aired. I mean, possibly, as far as I can tell, the organisation responds less to criticism it receives in the media, be it through documentaries or news reports, and more to legal pressure, more to scrutiny by government agencies. It would be a little bit unlike the organisation to water down their message in response to any media backlash. But who knows? I mean, maybe one day we'll interview someone or we'll have someone who can explain why exactly these videos were cut. But we're only halfway through. We've seen this young woman being exemplary in shunning her mother, even though she's conflicted, even though you can tell she really wants to be able to just do something as simple and innocent as have a conversation with her mother again, we're now going to watch the second part. Abel was essentially a spiritual orphan, but 
Regardless of what his parents chose, he listened to Jehovah and patiently waited on him to fulfill his promises. I never thought of it that way. What has Jehovah promised me if I patiently wait? Spiritual brothers, sisters, and mothers. I focus on what I do have and wait patiently, someday what I don't have may even come back to Jehovah. What vile propaganda that was. Yeah, the, having seen it, you know, the more I think about it, the more I'm thinking, yeah, I can see exactly why they have again surreptitiously cut this out from their JW stream. It's the sort of propaganda that sounds good when they're pitching it around the table in one of their writing committee or teaching committee meetings. Hey we should do a video about this and you know when you're talking purely among those who have been indoctrinated to accept this vile behavior as normal, maybe it sounds okay, maybe it makes sense when you're filming it and you're doing the scene, you're filming the scene and all that kind of thing, but you're basing your judgment on a policy, on a teaching that is, when seen from the outside, abusive and toxic. And maybe it just got to the point where even after the ship had sailed with regards to getting the convention materials out and, you know, putting this in all of the convention talks, maybe they just reached a point where the backlash, even among Jehovah's Witnesses, perhaps who were themselves shunning or being forced to shun family members, was just a bit too much. The reality of, of, of the message itself was just so vile and so disgusting that they had to manage things. They had to do some damage limitation and amend their spiritual food, change the menu of their spiritual food right after starting to serve the spiritual food to make the spiritual food a little bit less detestable. Thank you, 2023 Lloyd. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thus concludes my 10 worst Jehovah's Witness videos of 2023. Again, it could be that you disagree with my list. It could be that you feel that I've overlooked a certain video. By all means, drop a comment in the description and let me know your thoughts. Perhaps you're not happy with the ordering. Perhaps you think a particular video should be higher or lower in the list. That's great. It's, it's fantastic, to be honest, that there is such a spectrum of opinion. And we all get to have these opinions now, don't we? Uh, those of us, at least, who are free from the mental chains of indoctrination that Jehovah's Witnesses impose, using, in no small measure, these grotesque, manipulative propaganda videos at their conventions, in their JW broadcasting episodes, at their annual meetings, you name it. So I hope you found this particular rundown useful. Thanks again to my patrons and YouTube channel members for voting for me to make this video. But that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching. I'm